Going back on this thing you said, Dom, about the West, we have another piece of news this week. Uh, Palantir is going to expand its support as a strategic partner of Ukraine across a range of areas to deliver the following shared goals. And then uh, the press release goes into basically supporting the digital reconstruction slash transformation of Ukraine. And so this was really interesting to me. Uh, the press release talks about how uh, Palantir has been there since the beginning of the invasion. So a lot of Ukrainian governmental officials and the president obviously felt that if they were going to completely rebuild the country that has been war torn in a lot of different ways, then we might as well just have Palantir lead those efforts. I don't know if they're getting paid for this. I would assume there's some money on the table. Is it coming now? Is it coming later? Is this a handshake agreement? We have no idea. But I guess raw top level thoughts. How do you feel about Palantir being branded as a company that's rebuilding a war torn nation back from the bottom? You want to go first, Matt? Sure, I can speak to it. I mean, I think it's only right that Palantir gets the contract, right? I, it said, I think, in this article, or maybe it was a, a very similar article that was released, that Palantir CEO Alex Karp was the first CEO in country to go when everything kind of went down, right? And, you know, I read a funny tweet on Twitter basically being like, where was Frank Slootman and all this, right? Everyone can, you know, compares the two and their analytics tools. We'll talk right? about them in a second. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, I have a bunch of opinions. I listened to the conference call. It was, uh, I, I never made a snowflake video in my life and I had to because it was that crazy. But, um, but anyway, I think it's only right, right? I think the way that I think about it even more so specifically talking about, I think in either was in this or article or was a different article that, you know, you have a country which you could literally build up from the ground, you know, and, and create a, a culture around technology that, you know, is supportive or supported by the West and, and can be built into the West and and truly gives you that opportunity. Right. And what better if you're starting from basically the ground up, what what better to start from, you know, than pounds here. Right. I think the big problem and this gets into the, you know, not necessarily Ukraine versus Russia or anything like that. But the big problem that I think a lot of people have with converting to Palantir, it's not just getting data and stuff like that. It's you're literally changing how you operate with data and you use it as like a, a mobile uh, cell phone would. Right. Like it's an it's an operating system. It's like learning uh, a new Samsung phone versus an iPhone. Right. You have to transform how you actually look at things and think about things and how that particular thing operates because it was designed differently. And so what better time if everything's kind of gone to shit and no networks work and, you know, all the systems are completely broken than to create one big, great system that can help them get back to where they need to be and be the great nation that they were, you know, 18 months ago. Well, I guess it's 13 months ago. Yeah. I mean, Dom what kind of, what kind of companies uh, do you know that have the capabilities to do that? Right. They're, they also have to have the capability to provide value to do something like this. I think that's what immediately jumped out of me. Not surprised that they got the contract, but um, really interested in, in, in looking at like the your largest investments. How do the how do they stack against the competition? I don't think any company could do what Palantir does right now. And um, I was cutting the grass the other day and I was like, man, we were on this show, I mean, like long time ago and just talking about how Carp was like, people will know what our value is before they know it. Five years from now, they will, it will be realized. Yep. Like a lot of the things that he said, um, it's coming came true. To fruition. A lot of the things that Elon said, even if people want to get all bent out of shape about timelines have come true. Right. Um, and same with Jensen. I look back and I couldn't believe I was like, I should have like took another 25% of my portfolio and just put it in after last year's uh, analyst day. Everything he said about generative AI and all that stuff and GPT and all that was all in the investor deck. It was all there. It was all like I went back and looked at it and I just was like, this was right in front of my face and I just missed this. Um, and that goes to execution. That goes to visionary leadership and execution. Um, and so I'm really trying to get like my investing style down to like more simplicity. I know others will want to look at valuation and, and, and um, you know, technicals and all this stuff. But like if you're a long-term investor, 
I want to invest in visionaries and people that I believe can get mass amounts of people to follow them. And if they have the top talent and they have the right product, those two together can make sure that that's a company that stays around for a very long time. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah. Yeah. I I, I, that, I, go ahead, Matt. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I was going to say, I think the thing that differs most between some of the other companies that we'll probably talk about today versus Palantir is Palantir will be boots on the ground. Mm -hmm. building this place from the ground up from a digital perspective and, and making sure that they fix the problems that are truly there. They're not just going to be sold a piece of software from somebody else and say, you know, whatever you guys were doing before, just hook it up to your systems and, you know, you can relay and, and be able to, it's like, they need a legit like footing to stand on. Right. Like yeah. I think that all these other companies would just come in and, you have sales forces that are not sales force, the company, but sales forces that are 50% of the company's revenue mm -hmm. uh, gener generation and stuff of the like. And it's like, you know, you need a company that's truly focusing on and has 75, 80% of their people being technology folks with boots on the ground that are helping consult yeah. and, and move the company and steer it in the right direction. That's uh, what Ukraine's uh, looking for, right? They're uh, not looking for a piece of software. Two words of what you just said there, Matt. You said everything right there. Um, and this is what I hit home on when I'm in sales with customers and conversations is value realized and value proven. Uh, when you focus on those things as a company, the sales will follow. Focus on your people, focus on the product and process of getting value realized and value proven customers will buy customers don't want to be sold customers want to make the decision and then they want that decision to be a good one and to make it easy to quantify the roi that's why uh, my favorite line from the conference at findef was yeah we focus on value not sales sales are going to follow if you're if you're focused on delivering value everything else will follow and sales is a fixable problem, whereas value is a... Yeah, exactly. If your product can't deliver value, then <laughs> you can only put lipstick on a pig for so long and call it pretty. Right. I just want to say one thing, then we'll move on. Uh, the, the bottom of the press release for Ukraine said, Palantir support of Ukraine includes the provision of software to Ukrainian forces, and, uh, so that's like on the battlefield, and supporting the resettlement of Ukrainian refugees, including 110,000 in UK. So in March, when Ukrainians were leaving because there was a war going on, Palantir created the 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 basically digital infrastructure to make sure they can match refugees uh, to a desired home in the UK. So for example, if you're a vegetarian Ukrainian refugee, you can't stay in someone's house that doesn't eat, you know, or make vegetarian food at all, because like, you're not going to be able to survive, right? You, you can't just change how you eat. So they, there was a lot of variables that they had to be basically put into Foundry to be able to figure out how do we match these refugees with the right places, which was just very crucial work. And as you guys are saying, what other company is doing that? 